Now, uh, on to this morning's uh, first plenary uh, discussion and dialogue uh, on facing history. In 2006, under the leadership of Pre President Ruth Simmons, Brown University released a landmark report from their steering committee on slavery and justice. The report documented the participation of some of Brown's founders and benefactors in the 18th century transatlantic slave trade and presented recommendations on how to address this troubling legacy. More recently, President Jack DeJoya of Georgetown University released a report in 2016 uh, from the university's working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. Such examinations by Brown and Georgetown, another institution, creates a unique opportunity for higher education to confront the past in an open and honest manner. During this session, Ruth and Jack will reflect on the role of historical legacies of injustice on today's fulfillment of higher education's mission. And to moderate today's panel, please welcome the Chancellor of Foothill De Anza Community College District and ACE Board Chair, Judy Miner. Ted, thank you for the introduction. And Ruth and Jack, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'd like to set the stage with some brief context before you share your <clears throat> work and insights. So in 2006, Ruth, under your leadership at Brown, the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice released the Slavery and Justice Report covering three major areas. The establishment of Brown during the slave trade, an overview of varying atrocities such as war crimes and genocides, emphasizing the social responsibility institutions have in shaping conversations around social ideological change, and exploration of America's responsibility for justly atoning for injustices of slavery. And then Jack, a decade later in 2016, Georgetown University released its report of the Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation, also covering three major areas. The direct linkage of Georgetown's founding and success to America's slaveholding economy and culture, specifically through Jesuit-owned plantations in Maryland. Second, reconciliation and how to best present the current significance of the impact of slavery some two centuries later and a specific focus on how the institution can apologize for slavery atrocities. So I'd like to begin by asking each of you to share with us what motivated you to address these issues at the particular point in time that you did. So Ruth, we'd love to begin with you. Well, uh, when I was, uh, just as I was being appointed president of uh, Brown, um, there was a good deal of discussion in the country, especially among a certain group of scholars, uh, about reparations. And as you may recall, that was a very uh, complicated topic mm -hmm. that elicited a lot of, um, a lot of uh, disagreement uh, among scholars and among the public in general. In conjunction with the assertions that um, descendants of slaves deserved reparations, um, these scholars pointed out that Brown and Harvard and Yale, I believe, were complicit in this in a particular way because of the way we were founded. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, gee, it's too late to say no to Brown. <laughs> I'd already accepted. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I endeavored to find out, well, what was this story about Brown and slavery? I thought, certainly, I would need to know that. So as I uh, um, tried to find out, I discovered that the narrative at Brown was that there was no such connection to slavery. I went to the archives. I went to the public relations people. I looked in the histories of Brown eradicated from the history entirely. 
And so I thought, well, we need to find out the truth because universities are about truth, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought universities were about truth. <laughs> so, so I, I met with my cabinet. I said, you know, we owe the public um, uh, 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 the truth. So let's, let's do the research and find out what the story actually is. They immediately said, oh no, if you do that, you will be compromised because everybody will assume it's because you're African American that you're doing this. They were pressured, I would say, because that's exactly what everybody said. So they recommended that we do have a blue ribbon committee um, mostly of scholars uh, do this work. And so that's how the effort was born. Um, and uh, the first um, outcry was, in fact, this, I, we told you that African Americans should not be president of our universities, <laughs> because look at what she's doing, right? Mm -hmm. And even my, even my good friends, Jack, called me and said, girl, have you lost your mind? <laughs> um, <clears throat> So, uh, so that's how it got started. And, and thankfully, we had a wonderful, uh, serious uh, group of scholars uh, and students uh, led by James Campbell, a uh, Southern historian, uh, and Tony Bogues. And they took the time. There was such an outcry at the beginning. We knew we could not issue a report. Mm -hmm. So the, the report was issued years after mm -hmm. we started the work. Uh, and so they took the time very carefully to take, to walk people through the truth. And they did exhibitions, and they went into the schools, and they did all kinds of things. And when you bring up the objects, and one of the great things about Brown is that the Browns for whom our university was named were scrupulous keepers of records. Mm -hmm. And so we had the slave slave ship logs, ah. and we knew about the slaves who died, and we knew about their aims, and so forth. And so we, what we ended up disclosing to the public was that virtually every person involved in commerce in Rhode Island uh, at the time uh, were slave traders, or they benefited in some direct way from the slave trade. So we uncovered this massive amount of information that had been hidden right there on campus in the archives because the Browns were such excellent record keepers. Mm. That's how we started. Great. Jack, your story. Our, our arc is a little bit different, uh, but there, there are a number of similarities. Uh, but we launched the work that you were describing, Judy, in 2015. But really, to understand the arc, we've got to go all the way back to, to the founding of the university. So we were founded in 1789. Uh, in what was then the state of Maryland, uh, the first Catholic university in the United States. And we, this was the region where Catholics could practice. So if you're going to have a first Catholic university, this, it would have been here in this region. The Jesuits were responsible for our university. And in order to sustain their order, the economy in this region was agricultural, mm -hmm. and the Jesuits had plantations in southern Maryland. Our story begins with a tragic element in our history. In 1838, 272 enslaved children, women, and men were sold by the Jesuits to a, a landowner in Louisiana. Georgetown University arguably the most important project that the Jesuits had begun mm -hmm. was a beneficiary of some of the proceeds of that sale. Now this is a story we've known. There are books written about it. Uh, one of my colleagues in 1981 really did the work that Professors Campbell and Bogues did later at Brown. He did that work for Georgetown in the early 1980s. Uh, it, worked its way into our bicentennial history. In the 1990s, we had a course called the Jesuit Plantation Project that was taught to undergraduates in American Studies, which included the launch of a digital humanities website where we put all the records online. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. If there were anybody better at keeping records than the Brown family, <laughs> Jesuits. The, we, we got it all. We have birth certificates, <laughs> baptisms, we've got weddings, we've got it all. Mm. And all this material was placed online in the 1990s. So this was really well known. So we, let's flash forward in summer of 2014, after the, the, the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, we, we were getting ready for the start of the school year and a number of colleagues came together and we decided that we ought to launch a workshop, a, a teach-in of some sort on, on the opening day of school, not knowing yet whether there would be an interest in our student body, but just wanting to anticipate that. And then the first day of school came and we filled, filled our biggest hall. We had almost 800 people there for a, a series of, of, of a conversation with some of our most thoughtful scholars. And we realized that we had tapped into something that was very, very important. So over the course of the next year, uh, we were renovating a building. And the building on our campus, honestly, of all of our alums, no one could have told you the building had a name because we always refer to it as the Jez Res, which was a shorthand for the Jesuit residence. It was their home on campus. We built a new home for them and they, they had moved and the building had been boarded up for about a decade and we were in the process of renovating it. The building had a name. It was named for the Jesuit for whom, who was responsible for that 1838 sale. So I made a judgment in consultation with lots and lots of colleagues that we needed to you know, examine the implications of that sale for Georgetown mm -hmm. in the present and what should we do with the name on this building? That was the origin of this. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so then what unfolded um, was really, really, really something extraordinary. We found that the biggest, our first, we, had, we had a couple of surprises that emerged through the whole process. The first surprise was how few people really knew that history. When I announced the, the, the work of the working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, it was as if we were telling people this for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that, that was both surprising and very disappointing, but it also made it very clear that the working group had a responsibility to bring a whole community along on this journey. While we were on that journey, a number of other things unfolded following the death of, of, of uh, Michael Brown. Uh, we had Eric Garner in Staten Island and Tamir Rice and Freddie Gray. We, we had a series of incidents across our country. And then if you remember the fall of 2015, it was, it was quite, uh, there's quite intensity on our campuses mm. on issues related to racial justice. So while the committee on uh, this working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation engaged in its work, really focused on trying to help us as a university community come to terms with our history. We launched a, another group, a working group on racial justice, a Georgetown response, where we then tried to look at how a university in this moment could respond to the challenges of racial justice in our time. Let me just say one more word. There was a second surprise that emerged for us, and this was well into the work. So the work began in September of 2015 April, May of 2016, a, a group of, of descendants of the original 272 uh, enslaved children, women, and men who were sold by the Jesuits emerged and wanted to engage with us. We would never have presumed mm. to, to, that that would have been the case. And once it was, it opened up a whole new possibility for us, a whole new capacity to engage in work. I, I, I made it a point once, once it became clear. Um, I visited four cities, three in Louisiana, one in, in, in the state of Washington, in Spokane, to meet with families of descendants. And we've begun some you know, really important new work for the university um, as a result of that opportunity. Share the story of when you were there and families were meeting each other as they were going in and out of your appointment. Yeah. I thought so that was really I was, I was describing for Judy a little bit earlier that when I went down to uh, Louisiana, 
uh, first visit was in New Orleans. The first woman I met with was the parent of an alum of ours who is a descendant. Mm -hmm. And so this history is very complex, very rich, and, and has multiple dimensions to it. But uh, I went to Baton Rouge, and in Baton Rouge, uh, we, we just sort of you know, um, uh, set up um, a meeting place and f um, set up opportunities for families to come and, and, and to meet. And so we, we set these sequentially, but there would be overlaps sometimes. And in those overlaps, we'd be introducing folks for the first time, but they, they would start asking questions of one another. And before you knew it, connections were, were able to be established that were, that were pretty deep. That is wonderful. Both of your reports had a number of recommendations as to what the universities should be doing as, as follow-up. So could you each describe what you think maybe were some of the most important recommendations that came out of the reports? And how did your universities respond? Ruth? Well, uh, because of the way that um, we established our commission, I wanted uh, uh, let me let me just say uh, a word about about this. Mm -hmm. You know, as African Americans, uh, when it comes to issues of race and injustice, we often have little standing. Apparently, we're not entitled mm. to ask questions about things of deep interest to us. So. One of the things that I did was to make the commission very separate from me because I received a lot of criticism mm. about even engaging the question of uh, slavery. And I often opined that had I been white undertaking that, it would have been completely different. Mm -hmm. And so because it was very separate and I worked hard at keeping it separate, I wanted the recommendations to come to me unentangled with me um, so that uh, we could then uh, have a cleaner slate in terms of making decisions about what to accept and what not to accept. Therefore, the recommendations were, uh, that I received were some that I simply couldn't implement because I was African American. Had I been involved in writing the report and forming the recommendations, I, they would have been different. Tell us a little more about that. So, for example, the first uh, recommendation, and in many ways the most important one for the committee, is that we should issue an apology for what had been done mm -hmm. with regard to slavery. And I looked at the whole idea of this African-American president apologizing for slavery, and I thought it was so distasteful to me personally, mm -hmm. I simply couldn't do it. Um, and so, so we, had, we had a very complicated set of discussions mm -hmm. around that because it was something the committee had great difficulty understanding. Uh, but my view was, if the trustees want to apologize, good. <laughs> but I won't be apologizing. All right, so, so that was, that was one, that was one uh, complication. Um, but I also thought uh, that in some ways the committee missed the most important thing about their recommendations. And the most important thing about their recommendations was finally to be clean of the sin of erasing the story mm. of how this university was born. Uh, that was the most important thing. Uh, getting that out there um, in, the in the most um, uh, open way, opening up the records, letting people see what happened, letting people know that there's a clock um, in the office of the dean of the college that belonged to the captain of a slave ship. Let it, so we're walking around among all of these objects and these stories, and we have no awareness of what has transpired. And, and that's what history is. I mean, we, mm -hmm. to know and to have an opportunity to think about the implications of everything that, 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 that surrounds us is a, such a privilege. Mm -hmm. um, I also uh, thought that the uh, other important point 
pro uh, probably for me at least, um, was to, to demonstrate the obligation of universities when it comes to truth telling. Um, so many people thought that undertaking a subject like this would be divisive. Everybody said, oh, mm -hmm. why are you raising mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. It's so divisive, <laughs> divisive and so forth. And I wanted to really demonstrate that if universities can't do this most essential thing, <laughs> that what good are we anyway? And so, and so we, so the idea was to do it in such a way that people could understand that we would still be the same afterwards. That is to say, we'd still talk to each other. We'd still be one community. We'd still be the brown that everybody loves, mm -hmm. even though we have the ability to just tell the truth about ourselves. So, um, and that was the most marvelous thing about it, that, that um, to, to say that you can touch the third rail of race and survive it, to say that you can talk about the wrong that's been done and be forgiving. After all, the Brown family is still involved at Brown. They're still supporting Brown today. And we had to have these conversations in front of them. Mm -hmm. This is what your ancestors did. This is John Brown was the most infamous slave trader, you know. Um, he was prosecuted. <laughs> the first person prosecuted mm -hmm. uh, for uh, violating um, the uh, abolition of slavery uh, in, that, uh, in that area. So, so doing that, um, and I think the committee did it very deftly, but we survived it, and that was just proof that of how strong we are as a community and how important it is, these underlying values of universities, how strong they are. And that if we take them seriously and use them, we have much to teach the rest of the world. And um, we are in a difficult time now where we confuse truth and lies, uh, where people propel themselves to power uh, on the basis of lies. And if universities are not in the business of disclosing what is transpiring, what are we to do? So I take that role very seriously, and I believe that the community of Brown, after our study, I think they are so proud of the work that that committee did um, because they now understand how vital a story that is, and they have also committed themselves to doing different things as a consequence of that study. I'll say this and I'll finish. You know, we had a, I'm now at Prairie View University, uh, and we had a devastating storm with massive flooding. So when we opened the year, uh, this year, so many of our students had, had lost everything. And then a wonderful thing happened, and that is people at Brown sent money to pray, mm -hmm. oh, to help our students. And that's, and people talk about uh, reparations. Well, how do you repair? We're never taught that, you know, as we mm -hmm. come along. Mm -hmm. We're never taught, we're always taught that we should succeed. We're never taught that we'll fail at some things. And we have to discover ourselves how we repair what's been done. And so part of the repair in this country uh, that needs to go on is we need to confront the lies uh, that we've been told for centuries. We need to face up to them. And then we need to find a way to connect with our humanity and move beyond the sins of the past. And if you don't have a process for that, mm. how are you supposed to do it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm not surprised, though, that Brown reached out because in the report, it was very clear that there were recommendations that were very externally focused, such as um, support to the Providence schools yes. to engage children much earlier on. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is an important aspect of how the report led to the larger responsibility of the university. And, and clearly, you were very much a model for that happening throughout the country? Well, I think the idea was um, we cannot go back and, and 
find the descendants of the slaves mm -hmm. who built our administration building at Brown. Um, uh, and we can't go back and undo the things that have been done. But we can now understand in a new way the consequences of evil acts. Mm -hmm. And once you can understand the consequences of evil acts, you have an opportunity to assess what you might do in the future in order to avoid that same path. And so what the committee recommended is that we could, um, we could look at the children of Providence mm -hmm. as a way to um, begin to do work that would heal those wounds. Um, and so they established, um, they recommended the establishment of a fund mm -hmm. to help the schools of Providence, which we established. Um, they um, uh, thought that it was very important for people never to erase this history again. Mm -hmm. I mean, the willful erasure is so painful to recall, but it was absolutely willful uh, to, uh, as it was in the country in general, mm -hmm. because you know, the systematic forgetting after the Civil War was thought of as a way to heal the country uh, without taking into account the deep consequences mm -hmm. of those erasures uh, for those who had been victimized by this history. Um, so they wanted to make sure that forever after there would be a story linked to Providence and Brown and the history of slave, slave trading. And so a memorial was very important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but not just at Brown, but also in Rhode Island. And so we put together a group uh, working between the campus and the city and state to do a memorial in the city of Providence, which is now in place. And then we built a memorial on the campus. And I had not seen it because I was, uh, I was away from campus when it was actually installed. But it is right on the front of the campus, in front of the building that was built by slaves. Ah. And so uh, it's, I, I don't like it very much. I mean, I, 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 I shouldn't say that. But uh, as, I, I'm as, as, as art, uh, but, <laughs> but it, it well, we're all our <laughs> connoisseurs, right? Uh, so I would, have, I would have designed it a little bit uh, differently, perhaps, uh, but it was designed by a great artist who knows not much more about art than I do, thank goodness. <laughs> and, uh, but it is there now. Uh, and, uh, and all of the archives that have come to the, to, uh, to the fore, and all of the books that have been written. So there have been many books that have come out of this uh, that will forever have the record of what transpired. I'm very happy about that. That's wonderful, that is. Jack, tell us about the Georgetown. Sure, sure. Award. I want to um, emphasize a point that, that Ruth made, because I think what characterized both of our efforts is a profound belief in the university yes. that when we do our work and we do it in the best way we can, we do things that no one else in society Absolutely. can do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there were lots of uh, folks who were not all that enthusiastic about us taking on this kind of public project. We've mm -hmm. told the history. If people want to know, they just need to look at the books. And before we announced the, the, the working group, a, a number of folks had said to me, well, why did, no one knows the building has a name. Just change the name. Put another name on it. And I just, that didn't feel the right way to, to go. That's not how universities do things. So we, we, we began with the faith in a university doing the work of a university. And then we got tested all through the process. I'll give you one example. Um, early November 2015, and many of you remember where you were. It was a very, very challenging time on campuses across the country. Uh, there, there was a website dedicated to the demands that were being made on more than 70 campuses at the time. Mm -hmm. And I came into work on a, on a Friday morning, and I, had, I, was, I was welcomed by about, you know, I don't know, 50 or 60 students who wanted to say hello. And, 
And I, they were waiting outside the office. They were going to just stay there. And I said, no, come on in. We, we have a room big enough where we can all meet. And we met. And uh, the demand was, we want to take the names off the buildings, and we want to do it now. And I said, well, a couple of the members of the working group, student members of the working group, were in the room. And I said, well, you, you heard the charge to the working group. The charge to the working group was to come to terms with our history and to bring a community along. We didn't want to live in a place where one person had the, had the authority to make a decision about what name should be on a building. And I said, I've launched that work. That work is the work of a community. And I, I will, I'll bring this request to, to, the, to the working group. I'll ask them to convene today. A few of you are on the working group. You'll be there when I make the request. You can, you can uh, determine whether I am authentically carrying this, this request. And I did. And early, later that, after, that, that day, I met with the working group, and I said, a, a group of you have come to see me and have expressed the interest in, in, in taking the names off and changing the names. And now, not before we finish the work, now. And I said to them, I never told you you had to you know, submit everything in one report. If, if you're prepared to make a decision on this matter today, I'm prepared to receive that and bring it to our board of directors. If you're not, I'm prepared to live with the consequences, which meant I'd have a crowded office for a while. <laughs> uh, they deliberated for, for several hours that day, called me late that afternoon and said, uh, we are prepared to recommend to you that the name sh should come off of, the, there are two buildings associated, the name sh should come off of those, of those two buildings, um, but we're not prepared yet to really give you a recommendation on permanent naming, so we'll give you some interim naming. Mm -hmm. And so I then convened a call of our board of directors and shared with them that recommendation and, and then was able to announce it that weekend that we were going to make that, that first step at that time. But we had a, a, a different dynamic mm -hmm. in our context. I could apologize. And, uh, Good. And, <laughs> and what enabled it, what enabled it was, it, it, it was a recommendation that would likely have emerged in the same way from a committee. How, how meaningful that could be uh, was significantly um, altered by the emergence of a descendant community. Mm -hmm. So in April of 2017, just, just this past April, on Emancipation Day here in the district, mm -hmm. we had a, a formal liturgy on memory, contrition, and hope and invited the descendants in our, of our community to our campus we, were rep we had the, the liturgy included representation of the Archdiocese of Washington, the leadership of the Jesuits of North America, Georgetown University, and the descendant community. And in this liturgy, we, we marched into our main hall on campus, and more than 100 descendants marched in for that. It must for have that. been so powerful to do that. Hard, mm. hard to describe how, how, what it was like to, to be a part of it. But apology meant something very different in that context. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully that is a contribution we've made to you know, sustain this. See, this is the thing about all of these. And of course, we've probably both been involved in a lot of these uh, processes on different campuses around the world since we started. I know I have been. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. Um, they have to be embedded in the community because mm -hmm. communities do not derive the benefit mm -hmm. unless it unfolds in this way. Um, the idea that everybody should have ownership of this is inordinately Im uh, important, I think. Yeah. And the fact that it was a shared responsibility, not the responsibility of the president, not the responsibility mm -hmm. of the board, but a shared responsibility uh, is, is incredibly, uh, incredibly important. Um, I think somehow that I worry a lot today about the loss of trust that so many institutions are experiencing. Mm -hmm. 
and I worry about a future where nobody believes that there's any fundamental worth to any leadership, to any institution. And I think we teeter on the verge of that by certain kinds of behaviors where we compromise when it comes to integrity, where we compromise when it comes to hum humane behavior. And I just, I just think that's one of the most important responsibilities for people in this room, to maintain our institutions in a way that people can have trust in what we do. Trust because we... Mm -hmm. uh, trust because we are always elevating the conversation. Trust because we are hewing to uh, the values that we espouse. Trust because we're transparent. Trust because we tell the truth. I think the loss of that um, is, is going to be something that if we think what we see today is a frightening spectacle, mm. If all of our institutions lose that, and we have the kind of overlay of politics that we have today, what kind of world would that be? So that's what I worry about. And I think that the way that you undertook your study and the, uh, uh, the integration of um, the religious aspects of it, what would it have been like if, if, if the, with the history of Georgetown, if you had not done that. Um, and what it would, would have been with a mm -hmm. name like Brown mm -hmm. representing the most infamous slave trader um, if we hadn't done something like that. So I, I think we are still at a point where we can um, uphold the virtues of the, in, uh, of the um, sector that we're in. Uh, people get angry at universities. I love it when people get angry at universities because we're doing the right thing. <laughs> because I think the lasting effect of that will be that we will hold the public's trust because we do. Well, you've both demonstrated so much courage and integrity, um, really acting on the values of, of your institutions. Uh, as you think about that, what advice might you offer people in the audience as they may be thinking themselves about addressing historical injustices at their own institutions? Because I, I think we want to move in that direction and maybe people have not thought about that before today. I think um, R Ruth has shaped the, the answer in her, her prior comment, which is we have to engage authentically as universities. And if we, do not, if we do not understand that that authenticity is grounded in the very integrity that she was describing a moment ago, then we're incapable of doing the work of universities. When we do our work, and we do it the way in which we are you know, drawing from the history of the academy, when you think about what it is that we represent when we're at our very best, again, Ruth's earlier comments regarding our commitment to truth. As long as we are prepared to accept the implications mm -hmm. of where the truth leads us, the work that we're capable of doing is, is, can be done by no other part of our society. And we have to be able to do that work and what I, the, any advice I would give to anyone on this would be, be true to your community. Be true to the values that animated your founding, that guide you today, and recognize that there, there, will, be, there will likely be more who will resist mm -hmm. than who will support, but the truth is what enables us to realize our full promise and our full potential as people. I think that what Janet Napolitano has been doing at the University of California is so consistent with that because mm -hmm. when you read the founding documents of the University of California, you know, you want to cry because it, it's a powerful statement mm -hmm. of the obligation of the university to the citizens 
and in a sense to the, to the least of its citizens. And so I, what I, when I hear about the, those activities, I think going right back to the source mm -hmm. and discovering what's appropriate today in the context of why that system was established, what could be better than that? But let me just say that, that um, you know, I go to a lot of uh, campuses and um, you know, there's so many people today who want to become a university president, but, but you know, it's not always fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I'm sure you'd say this has been, this has been your experience too, but um, we talk a lot in university life about transparency and shared governance but we violate that all the time, mm. all the time. First of all, at some point in time, I don't know what point in history we started doing this, but we started lying a lot about our universities. Yes, <laughs> we, we want our universities to thrive, and so we tell stories about how wonderful we are in all kinds of different areas when we know it's not true. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we stand before the public and we hide secrets from them. Mm -hmm. uh, now some things are confidential in university life and of course you can't, you can't willy nilly go out and, and share those. Um, but there's a lot that you can share. And so I think personally we don't share enough information for fear of how we'd be judged if people knew fundamentally what we are doing within you know, within those walls. But it's really quite the opposite. The more you share, the better off you are. And, uh, and so I think what we try to do is just to be honest and to tell the truth um, uh, whenever we are in a position where people need to know what's happening, we try to win the trust of our campuses by telling the truth even when it hurts to tell the mm -hmm. truth. And if you do that, uh, then your students don't leave you. They don't. Um, even when they're angry with you, they don't leave you. Because the one thing I would say, given the national leadership that our students need to see up close every day, is someone who is honest, someone who is truthful, someone who believes in um, in all of the, the values and virtues that they believe to be important. And if they don't see it in their president, if they don't see it in their vice presidents and their deans, where will they see it today? Um, other than maybe in the pulpit. Indeed. Uh, so, so, you know, I think we need to be very conscious of the fact that we are on the spot right now to offer some hope to uh, young people about what they can be, how good they can be, how authentic they can be, how truthful they can be, how caring they can be. And so I you know, go to work every day thinking, okay, um, maybe I don't feel hopeful uh, today, but I'm just gonna fake it. <laughs> Uh, because somehow there has to be some way for people to see that there is a brighter future ahead than we can see right now. I'm getting very dark. I, I, I'll get no, off. You, no, you aren't. Yeah, so. Well let, said, let, Ruth. Let me, Jack. Let me pick up, though, on yes, what I think do. is And a, then we'll go to questions. Sure. But what I think is an important theme. We've talked a lot about coming to terms with our history. Mm -hmm. it, it, at the same time, what, what I think Ruth has just described is how important is that we bring this, what we've learned, mm. forward. So we're, we're almost 230 years old. We're, we're young compared to a brown. But, <laughs> but we, we were founded in a tradition that's more than 450 years old, the Jesuit yep. tradition. And this goes back you know, 2,000 years mm -hmm. in terms of the, the, the Catholic Christian tradition that we're a part of. But what we learn in experiences like this is that, that tradition that we're a part of 
is never static. It's never fixed. It's organic. It's unfolding. It's alive. And moments like this enable us to find new ways to draw out the very best of our communities. And for us, this, is, this was not just about coming to terms with the past. It was about understanding what our responsibilities are as we move forward. The, the Jesuit tradition, again, 450 years old, but it's, it itself is in a, a work in process. And, and an earlier leader of the Jesuits nearly 40 years ago, a little over 45 years ago, once challenged all of our institutions. To what degree do you meet the demands of justice in our world? Mm justice for a university became a new kind of challenge for us to take on. And we've been wrestling with that now for, for nearly a half century, very intentionally, very explicitly in our tradition. As we think about the implications for our country in this moment, the, the failure in 1838 and fa the failure in 1860, 1865, we never ameliorated the original evil of slavery and then subsequent segregation in our country then. We're wrestling with the implications of no. that now. No. Absolutely. And our institutions have a responsibility today to engage that work. And we now know as a result of the work we've, that we've, we've, we, we engaged in how crucial it is that we accept that responsibility in this moment. What I say to, uh, absolutely. What I, what I often say to institutions that I've been helping with their particular, <clears throat> their particular uh, foray into this area, um, I said, you, you, you know, you can't go back and control what happened before. Mm -hmm. But what you can control is what might happen in the future. And so that's what, that's the exciting part of it, to worry about what you can put in place today that will forestall some of the, some similar practices in the future. That's, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. So I'm going to do a Ted Mitchell. I want a show of hands. How many of us will engage in this work? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Outstanding. So we will now open it up for questions. So we've got the microphones in the usual places. Um, if you'd like to line up there, we'd be happy to have Ruth and Jack respond. Please. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the, the panel. John, I have a question for you and at Georgetown. Um, when you're meeting with descendants, are there other policies in place for, for their children to engage with your campus, possibly as students? Do, you, do they have a different status? Yeah, that, perhaps what might have got the most attention <laughs> um, when we presented our report. We, our, our report was presented to me by our, our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation in the summer of 2016. Had a whole range of recommendations. Uh, we, we presented it in the town hall uh, uh, to, to our community on September 1st, 2016. Probably the recommendation that got the most attention immediately was um, uh, our decision to regard our descendants in the same way that we regard the, the children of our faculty, our staff, and those alumni who are, who are deeply engaged in an enduring way with our university community. We call that legacy admissions. And we, we, we made a determination we were, would regard the children of our descendants in the same way that we would, we would regard. They, they would receive the same kind of care and attention that we give. Our, now, we're a highly selective institution. I don't want to overstate what that means, um, but we, we are giving that kind of attention. Thank you. Sure. Hello, um, Raynard Kington, I'm president of Grinnell College. And I'd like your advice about a different situation related. So we were founded by abolitionists, which we love to talk about. J.B. Grinnell founded first congregational church in Washington and was run out of town for its anti-slavery views. Grinnell hosted John Brown on the way to Harper's Ferry, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's recently come to our attention that our founding fathers, who all came, they were all fathers, all came from New England, um, would have been appalled that I'm president because they didn't believe in racial equality. 
and were pretty clear about that, as many abolitionists were. And even though we had a few graduates early on, as late as the, the mid-40s, a friend who's doing research at the American Friends Service Committee in the 40s, they sent out representatives to elite schools around the country saying, why aren't you having black students? And there, so there's a whole archive of all the responses to those visits, including one from Grinnell saying, eh, not so interested. Maybe one woman. Um, so, so how do you, uh, I have mixed feelings about bringing this up because we love to talk about our abolitionist roots <laughs> as many of the schools in the country do, um, but it's a more complicated story. Advice? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I personally do not believe that, I mean, I alluded to this earlier, but I think you have to be very careful as a university advancing a public relations-like stance about your institution, because it can very quickly contaminate um, the narrative about what you represent. And so um, I don't think you need a complicated study uh, in order for documents to reflect the truth. Uh, and so, you know, I remember when uh, I was on the board of trustees at Princeton when the students, um, when there was an upheaval about Woodrow Wilson, and I was asked to serve on a, on a, a committee to help them figure out what they should do about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, now, there's a beautiful narrative about Wilson. Uh, he is someone who was pivotal in creating um, the pathway to what Princeton is today. Uh, and so, uh, such a treasured um, uh, symbol for Princeton. There is a Woodrow Wilson School named after him. But then, he's a racist. He was a racist, so what do you do with that? So. Um, you know, to me, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, people before us may have thought in their wisdom that it was good to tell, um, to have a narrative that was attractive. I think today what's more important, given the environment we're in, is to tell a narrative that's truthful. Uh, because the, the, the follow-on to that is going to be more robust and less contaminated um, because, you know, the old saying, the truth will out. The problem with burying um, facts like that is that um, they can surface at a moment that is the most inconvenient for you. Uh, and this is the one thing that our president is very good at. Um, he leads with something that he knows is coming out that's really horrible. And so by the time it gets out, uh, then am I not supposed to talk about politics? I probably not, but okay. So, uh, but by you the time, talk about by the, time the truth gets out, um, the public is saying, hey, well, okay, we already knew that, you know, so what's the big deal? So, so that, that is a, that's a masterful strategy. Um, uh, but the tr uh, but so I would say what you want to do in your narratives about your history is to say what actually was the case, okay? And so what Princeton ultimately did was to change the narrative. All of those beautiful narratives about how heroic Wilson was have now been um, revised to include the fact that he was racially problematic in the way that he resegregated the civil service when he became president of the United States. And Renard, I, I would just add uh, to, to what Ruth, Ruth just said. There's a moral urgency for us right now mm -hmm. to think hard about those narratives because the degree to which those narratives were, were misleading or were, were simply un, were not telling the truth. I mean, as I mentioned a moment ago, we live today with the consequences of failing to ameliorate the original evil back in the mid-19th century well, what, what unfolded were the construction of narratives that try to deny that, that very history. We've been doing some of the work locally here. You would be very, you, by, by virtue of your own, your own background, you'd be very familiar with some of the work we've been doing on health disparities. The average difference between you and I living in Washington today in life expectancy is 15 years, today. 
between a white man and an African-American man in Washington today. On, on net worth, it's 81 times a, a white family and an African-American family. I mean, the, these disparities that we wrestle with today, we can't ignore. There's a, there's a, a, a moral urgency for us as a nation. Here we are on the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report. What would that look like if they were starting it today? Would it look a lot different if they were writing it today? And I think part of the challenge that, that you've identified, and I think Ruth just, just described, we've got to make sure our narratives capture the truth. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Dr. Melanie Harris, an ACE fellow at the University of Denver. Thank you for this brilliant conversation, very honest and truthful. My question was about the nuances and the differences of your, both your, your responses, um, one as an African-American president and woman really taking that recommendation and thinking about that kind of disconnect, and then one as a social location of a white male president and actually moving into the community to apologize. Can you share a little bit more about the ways in which you came to that understanding in yourself? How did you engage or what resources did you engage to recognize the racial consciousness that you yourselves had to have in order to make that decision? Well, <clears throat> um, each of us has uh, a, a unique history. Uh, we grow up, uh, we have parents, we live in neighborhoods, we're educated different places. Um, we are female, uh, we are transgender, we are male. There are so many different parts to us. Uh, and I was very fortunate that by the, I was very fortunate to grow up in a segregated environment where uh, I was taught that I was unworthy, that I would never be anything, that I could never succeed, uh, and where I could not go into places simply because I was black. So, so that, was, that was my, uh, early conditioning, so I knew something of the consequences of these actions that had taken place uh, long ago. Uh, and knowing that, I thought I had a very particular privilege as president of Brown because I knew it uh, and could understand it at a level that most people could not. And while I knew that I would be criticized for being biased in that regard, uh, when my, you know, uh, when my friend said, um, "Are you crazy?" Um, yeah, in a way, I was crazy because, um, as the first African American president of an Ivy League university, I didn't want to sully uh, the ground that I stood on by being. Uh, by lacking the courage to do what was right. Because of all of that path that I had followed and my parents had followed, I, could, I had a chance to do one worthy thing um, that could help the country uh, and that could help a lot of different people understand where they are. So, so I, um, thanks to my parents, I never apologized for my race. I never apologized for the fact that I was a product of segregation. I never apologized for the fact that I went to a historically black college. I have, was never about the business of apologizes for, apologizing for who I was. And so when something came along that was related to race, I felt that I could face it because I was, after all, who I was. And my unique experiences gave me the ability to handle it a particular way that would have been different from the way that Drew Faust handled what was happening at Harvard or anybody else, or Larry Summers. So, um, so it's just, I, I always say to people who are on this path, the most important thing that you can do is to learn who you are uh, to learn what you care about, 
and then be prepared to stand in that place and hold your ground on the basis of that authenticity. And if you do that, you'll be fine. But if you can't do that, you're going to be buffeted about in so many different ways. And for me, <laughs> for me, um, this is my 43rd year at Georgetown University. I, I wow. arrived as an 18-year-old, and I've been at the university yeah. since I was 18. Um, <laughs> and along the way, I've been in the administration for 35 years. I started as the assistant to Father Tim Healy, our president. Um, the joke in, in my office right now is if you saw where my assistant's desk was and where my current desk is, in the course of 35 years, I've moved exactly five feet. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but along the way, I, 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 was the, I was our chief student affairs officer. I was the, kind of the chief operating officer for our main campus and then for our university. I grew up in the place. When we launched this work, uh, we, we launched first the Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. I sent a letter out to the university community. No, not unusual, I, I, I communicate often in that way. But as I was describing earlier, what unfolded in our country and what, what I felt was needed by the university, that group was charged with a very specific task, and that was to come to terms with our history in middle of the year, I decided that I would give a talk to the whole university community and launch a new, a new effort on racial justice, a Georgetown response. And that required that I find my voice in a new way mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in a public setting. And it, this, is what I, this is a piece of what I said to my colleagues. I said, you know, normally when you hear me give, give in this talk, I, I didn't say we're going to think about a few things. I said we're going to do the following. And I outlined some specific concrete things we we're going to do. And I said to, to my colleagues, now normally, you've known me all these years, I usually come and say, I think we ought to think about this. And what, why don't we launch a, a group that talks about and No, no, we're going to do this. And if this sounds familiar to you, if these words that I'm saying today and the way in which I'm articulating this if this sounds familiar to you, these are your words. I was looking in, at the audience, and they were my teachers. They were my colleagues. They were the people who taught me what it meant for us to respond in this moment. So there was, a, for me, an authenticity that came from growing up in a place that, from the day I arrived, had been wrestling with this. And we had some exceptional leadership, but we had members of our faculty, members of our community who enabled me to become the person that I am. And it, it, was, it was those words that I was able to articulate in that setting. Thank you. Thank you for what needs to be our last question. I think it's a, it's a great ending. And before we go out of the room, Jack, any last words? And then I'm going to let Ruth have the last word. No, it, for me, it's always a privilege to have this chance to be with Ruth. And, uh, and I, well, I'm proud to welcome you back into the community of university presidents. Uh, you failed retirement. And I failed retirements and how. <laughs> so, but you know, it's a wonderful thing to be old and to do this job. No, it is, it is. And you know, I, I always uh, say to, uh, on my campus that, you know, um, I'm now too old to be doing this job. And so keep in mind that, uh, uh, you know, whatever you say, whatever you do, I don't care. Uh, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing what I think is the right thing to do, and I love it. I would just, so, so, uh, so I, uh, I really, so, you know, once, once you've been retired, you always know you can go back to that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so, so I say, send me back to retirement, please, you know? <laughs> but, but I'm on a wonderful uh, campus, and, um, and just let me say that um, I trust so much and hope so much uh, for the people in this room. Uh, 
I, I can't even describe how much I think you're going, the burden is going to be on you. We have all these young people who are out there hoping that they're going to have a future and that that future is going to be full of things they can believe in, full of uh, people who do the right thing, full of the hope that we teach them to have, and it is all resting on your shoulders to make sure that it's going to be there for them. So, um, so as you go about your work, just be aware of how they are watching us and hoping that we come through for them. I, for one, am wedded to the idea of coming through for them. I hope you will be too. That was great. <laughs> Thank Thanks, Zach. Thank you. It's always an honor for me.